It's a pleasure to be here with you. Today we are having our session about El Niño in the Americas promoting health and protecting health and increasing resilience. We have two speakers for you today. We have Jose Marengo, who works at Semaden, the National Center of Monitoring and Natural Disaster Alerts of Natural Disasters. He has published extensively on the topics of climate variability and extreme weather events such as droughts, floods, and hurricanes. And our second speaker is Carolina Portalupi Castro, an economist from Ecuador with a postgraduate degree in human development and education and is right now coordinating the master's degree in public administration and is a professor of public policies at the Casa Grande University in Ecuador. Right now, we're going to do some housekeeping and some things you should remember. Today's session is hosted by PAHO, the WMO, the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Office, the II, NOAA, and Columbia University. Okay, as for the interpretation, this session is available in Spanish or English. At the bottom of your screen, you have a button where you can choose the language you wish you want to listen to. Today is October 19th, so we're going to be discussing disasters and disaster risk reduction. I hope you have joined us for the previous sessions, and we also invite you to attend the sessions uh, next week on October 24th and 26th, where we'll be discussing vector-borne and zoonotic diseases and air quality. Well, today's uh, session is a 90-minute session, and at the end of the session, um, throughout the session, you can uh, submit your questions. And so at the end, we will have a Q&A with the speakers. This session will be recorded, and all materials will be uploaded to the website so that you can review it later. The slides from these presentations will be available on the website. There are some recommendations made by PAHO, and there's a link that we will post in the chat very shortly with short-term recommendations for addressing um, the disaster risks brought by El Niño. And without further ado, let's begin with our speakers. First, we have Jose Pengo. Jose, Good morning. It's wonderful to see you here. And let's begin with your presentation. OK, so may I begin? Yes, please go ahead. Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, we can see it. 
Well, I'm only going to make my first remarks in uh, Spanish. I'm from Peru, so my Spanish is almost perfect. And then I have lived in Brazil. So thank you, Noah Bajo, Columbia University, for asking me to be in this such an important course related to El Niño and its impact on health. Yeah, the sense of impacts on the regional risk disaster, including hurricane floodings and landslides. Uh, this is a very uh, current, important subject because right now we are in the middle of an El Niño. And in countries in South America, we are already noticing the, the impacts, like the huge drought in the Amazon region, as well as the extreme floods in southern Brazil. But for this, for instance, we base a lot in seasonal climate forecast and early warning systems to allow health systems to anticipate and prepare for such events. I mean, there are several sectors affected for disasters, basically disasters related to climate, and the health sector is one of them. So the, the idea, I mean, like this course is recommendations for action, management, and response with available tools for decision maker and risk management management and reduction. Of course, reduce the impacts on vulnerable communities and health infrastructure. Uh, so there was a, a paper published in The Lancet for what in 2017. It was a quite extensive paper in terms of a review. Uh, it was a review paper on climate change and health. It was published. I'm not sure if there has been any update of it, but the idea is to develop the connection between climate hazards and vulnerability of people exposed to them, particularly with the health sector. Of course, the idea of this is to improve adaptation, protective adaptation, mitigation intervention, mitigation in terms of uh, damage reduction, and the economical and financial tools available to enable responses from the political uh, public engagement to facilitate. So this is this is not just this climate science, it's basically the policy, the government and the population that should participate on this access. Okay, so they have different impacts, like for instance, what well, we have been noticing all around the world, particularly in the last, in the recent decades, the increase in the frequency of extremes, either heat waves, cold waves, or which are related to mortality. I mean, the there was a paper published this year that the European heat wave in 2022 killed almost 61,000 people, directly or indirectly, which it means that any country, regardless if it's European, the US, all of them are exposed to climate extremes, and resilience doesn't seem to be uh, something which is already going on. So it doesn't matter if you have the best climatology, the best forecasts, there are still impacts on population. The, what we have here in Brazil, for instance, floods and storms. People die, they uh, drown. In the recent disasters we have in southern Brazil, I mean, I'm referring to southern Brazil because we, we are examples, like 58 people dead. Most of them are people over 60 years old and women. So talking about the vulnerable sectors, it's not just the population, it's the profile of the population dying. And of course, the issues of clock failure, respiratory disease uh, due to biomass burning, for instance, the drought in the Amazon now, the smoke is moving to cities like in Manaus, where many people have been affected by the smoke in there, and also water polluted due to high rainfall or uh, pollution of of water like cholera and uh, malaria. Some of the examples in this paper uh, by Watts, for instance, if we talk about the Americas, let's say National Meteorological and Hydrological and World Health Organization reporting to provide targeted climate information used for the health sector. I mean, in some continents, like the European region is 49%, in Southeast Asia is 18%. In uh, the Americas is 51.4%. So the paper showed this kind of, of detail by country. Like, like Brazil, in the US, for instance, they have 
the National Assistance of Climate Change Vulnerability and Adaptation for the Human Health. Uh, there are measures to increase climate resilience, like Brazil, for instance, the measures are still unknown or are prepared at the state level because Brazil is a, a federation. I'm not sure about the other countries, but Peru, uh, Colombia, they have, uh, uh, this uh, health instruction has not been taken. I mean, this is six years ago. I'm not sure if this information has been updated to 2022 or 2023. But in terms of the health anti El Niño, in this presentation, uh, what we try to do is to promote the use uh, to see the importance of forecast information and early, weather, early warning systems for the health sector. Now we can see with existing climate models the development of El Niño, months ahead, for instance. We know that the possibility of having droughts in some regions on, around the world or floods in other regions around the world are there because of the seasonal forecast. And we are using them as a main tool, for instance, for planning agricultural activity, disasters, preparedness, okay? And also the health sector, it is a need for this sector to, to improve its capacity in the use of meteorological and climate resources. So the communities have been working basically separate, but I would say it's since 2007, with occasion of the third assessment report and the Nobel Prize from IPCC, the Peace Nobel Prize, uh, there have been a lot of collaboration between the health sector, agricultural, climate, and uh, hydro water resources sector. So the best example to see on the extremes is El Niño, and the opposite, which is La Niña, okay? There are changes in temperature, in hurricane activity, for instance, normally or usually during El Niño, we have less hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, but this year we have more. So there is not a general rule, meaning that this El Niño currently is unique, it's different from the others. And that has to do with climate change, we don't know yet, but we know it's very, very different from the others. You know? And of course, there are evidences that El Niño is associated with increase of natural disasters. And when we talk about natural disasters, it's basically those of them related to hurricanes or those of them related with too much water, like landslides, flash floods, or drought. Okay, and of course, they have the impact on the population. And there are several studies that shows that the Niño cycle is associated with changes in the risk of disease transmitted by mosquitoes, for instance, uh, which are uh, favored by high temperatures and water in there. Malaria is, an, is another disease that may occur if the weather conditions make this transmission possible, okay? And this is the information in terms of disasters. Uh, Recently, the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction didn't like too much the word natural on disasters. So before we were referring to natural disasters, and now we just say disasters, okay? Because they think that the disasters are not natural anymore. But most of them, or the figures are related to climate. Yeah, like 90.3% of the disasters between 2020 and 2021 have been related to climate. Like uh, if you see, for instance, the number of natural hazards, uh, weather and climate extremes fall in the category of natural hazards. And then we see the increase also of, of the type of disaster per year, most of them related to climate. And also the disaster caused for wildfires. Wildfires in several regions are highly correlated with compound dry heat events, which means drought conditions, and huge wave temperatures. And when we talk about disasters, oh, well, this is the only uh, Portuguese uh, language uh, slide that I have the title, but the other is in English. And when we talk about disasters, it's not just the climate, because we have the hazard, which is the weather and climate events, but we also have the vulnerability of the population, like for instance, the profile of populations, if this population is more women, the gender thing, the age thing, and also the exposure. That meaning that many cities or sectors of the cities are built in risk areas, nearby the rivers, nearby slopes, that they shouldn't be there, but they are there. 
So when we talk about a disaster, we have, do have to think about those. Weather and climate, we can predict with models. Vulnerability and exposure cannot be predicted by models. They have to be basically public policies, you see? And when we talk about climate, we talk about natural climate variability, which is el niño, la niña, and anthropogenic climate variability, which is the influence of the human activities. There are some studies that shows that the human activities are changing natural climate variability. That's possible, but there's still there are some uncertainties. And of course, as an answer to that, to avoid the impact of the disasters, we need measures for disaster risk management and also the adaptation to climate change. These are the main things that we have to consider. And in terms of disasters, black uh, Latin America and Caribbean, this is for 2022 only. If you see the number of reported events, 63% are related to water floods. In, uh, in terms of death, 74% are related again to floods. In terms of affected people, 58% are related to storms, which means tropical cyclones and hurricanes. But if you see the economical damage that perhaps doesn't kill people directly, is 44% of the economical damage comes from drought. So depending on the disaster and the sector, we have to see the importance of this. And this is basically for 2022. In 2023, this is part of the state of climate for Latin American Caribbean, uh, an annual report from WMO. Um, for sure, for 2023, we may see this figure a bit different. Okay, But what is a disaster? So we may have an earthquake, we may have a tsunami, we may have a volcanic eruption. Those are natural disasters. But when we talk about real, uh, the hazard, for instance, the hazard could be, uh, you see the clouds in there, too much rainfall or sea level rise. And then we see the vulnerability and exposure and then the risk of disasters. You see vulnerability and exposure is, is basically when we talk about disaster, we have three components, the hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. The houses that are built where they are not supposed to be built, but they are they're right there. And you see the same thing with the coastal regions. Some of the sea level rise and storm surges are getting stronger and you see the disasters and the disaster is the people. So when people say the rainfall killed 200 people, it's not the rainfall, it's the rainfall uh, the disaster uh, triggered by rainfall. Because if you have a lot of rainfall in a region when there is no population or very, very low population, uh, you may see it, that's not a disaster. That basically is a weather extreme. So what we have in the circle of, of things, you see, for instance, if you start with where? Uh, preparedness. We have the impact of disaster. We have the response. We have the rehabilitation, reconstruction, and mitigation. And in several places, most of the governance of disasters are related, for instance, to weather forecast, like it's going to rain 100 millimeters in 24 hours. And then you go to the response, like the civil defense saying that 200 people die or things like that. So the preparedness is extremely more important. This is what we do in Brazil, in my center, Semade, is the preparedness, which means that the monitoring of conditions that may lead to a disasters, and then the issue of warnings, early warning systems, like different levels of alert, a high, medium, low, for the disaster related to too much water. Uh, basically, if it rains at, in the afternoon, probably you will see the flood or landslide at night. And for drought, it's a bit different. For drought, we have more like a longer time scale. We have a better monitoring. But these are the disasters that kill more people, the ones related to water, too much water, intense rainfall and rain, rain, uh, record rain there. Okay, so there is a relation between the type of disasters and the effects on health. You see, some of the effects are potential rather than inevitable. For example, population moving and another changes may lead to increase in risk of disease transmission. Uh, this happens in uh, the drought of 
1877-79, which is what related to El Niño, in the state of Ceará in Brazil. The different reports, uh, they show between 100,000 and half a million people dead because of the drought, but not because of the, the exposure directly to the drought. It's like uh, the city of Fortaleza, which is the capital of the state of Ceará, didn't want the people in the city. So they both they built some refugee camps and people died in those refugee camps because of health, healthy, unhealthy conditions, you see? So uh, the actual of potential risk after a disaster, it doesn't occur all the time. Sometimes they could be different in different areas, exposed areas, or maybe less in areas which are not exposed, you see? So disaster creates a need for food, shelter, and primary health care which are uh, usually not total. When we talk about healthcare, it's not just the broken bones or the wounds. This time it's also the psychological problem because in a disaster we have in Brazil in November 2008, in Santa Catarina, southern part of Brazil, uh, the study showed that two or three years later, some of these people that survived, they committed suicide or developed depression. So there are some long-term effects in terms of health. And there's needs for the management of health and humanitarian aid, of course. And in terms of Latin America and Caribbean, uh, cash is the most effective donation, particularly since it can be used to purchase supplies locally. The problem with cash sometimes is the corruption, which actually is something endemic in, in our region. So just giving you some examples, uh, in Brazil, for instance, the climate change in the Amazonia Cerrado, particularly in this boundary, because this is the soybean or the new agricultural frontier, the droughts in Brazil. In the Pantanal, we have the droughts and fires a few years ago. Floods in several cities, like in the city of Santos, which is a coastal city related to sea level rise, and also the flash floods and landslides in many regions in the eastern part of Brazil, which is the highly dense population. And you see some statistics in there, which actually have to be updated, but you see the, the cost of Brazilian economy. This is $2.2 billion at the time the dollar was three reais. So divided by three, you have an idea of the cost of flash floods between 1995 and 29, 2019. So in terms of governance of disasters, that the way it works in Brazil, we have, for instance, the prevention of the disaster, which is basically in terms of infrastructure preparedness, which is a, a ministry of integration and regional development. Then we have the mapping of the risk areas for disasters like landslides and floods, which is made by the Brazilian Geological Survey. We have then the monitoring of conditions, which include meteorological conditions and geological and I would say population conditions, anti-alerts that are issued by SEMADEN, and then you see the response. So this is basically the governance of disasters in Brazil is divided in several and different ministries. You see? And sometimes this is good, sometimes this is bad, because of sometimes there are no communication or there are faults in the communication of a risk of a disaster, for instance, and then people die as a consequence of that. Okay, uh, that's the way Semaden works. Uh, Semaden as a center from the federal government works in disaster risk reduction. We don't issue weather forecasts. We use forecasts of, of disasters, basically what we call early warning systems. But we have a strong collaboration and interaction with meteorological agencies, uh, risk analysis and disaster vulnerability agencies, global geological mapping, hydrological information, local communities, we also have interactions with scientific institutions such as universities and research institutes and international collaborations with the US, with Europe, Japan, the BRIC countries, the Mercosur countries. And then comes the other part. When a disaster alert is issued, it is sent to Senat, which is the National Center for Disasters. And then the alert goes to the civil defense and then the civil defense in Brasilia, the executive secretary over there, they send it to the civil defense of the municipalities 
where the alert has been issued. And this is basically, it should take as short as possible. So what we do in my center in terms of disaster risk reduction, the other is the disaster risk management. So basically the pre-disaster, during disaster, and post-disaster. You see, this is the sequence we work. And uh, what happened recently, according to the National Municipality Confederation, I mean, the number of people dead, they say for excess of the shuba, it's not the ex rainfall excess, it's the disaster triggered by rainfall excess. Like we have 9,494 people dead, including 30, 130 in the city of Recife in June due to landslides. And you see the number of deaths increasing, but at the other side, we see the investment of the government to cope with the disaster has been decreasing. You see, we start some major problem because the rainfall, it depends on the age which will be the hazard, depends on the meteorological services, and the B and E, vulnerability and exposure, which has to do with uh, municipal, state, and federal agencies and government, basically government, human actions. Okay. And in terms of disasters, uh, the climate services that the, the, the country offers, perhaps the figure is the most important there. Because uh, for 2021, we did an analysis, and according to the different meteorological services, 11 offer the essentials for. Uh, uh, something what we could be uh, uh, considered as an early warning system. But the full capacity for early warning system is only two countries in Latin American region. Okay, only five members fall into the full advance, full and advanced, with basically five countries the uh, orange, no, the yellow, uh, and the, uh, uh, the advanced, you see. But the other members, the member members have only a core capacity level, which is means it's not enough. It's there, but it's not enough, you see? So disaster risk reduction is fundamental for this. It's considered not just as a matter of science, it's also a climatic of climate justice and climate resilient development. And if we talk about the present, imagine for the future. So the idea of consider future climate sense scenarios, like a changing in extremes may imply increase in the risk of disasters if vulnerability and exposure don't change. It's very, very hard to reduce vulnerability and exposure for cities that are already built there for decades or hundreds of years. So they have to be some policies for re disaster risk reduction, some of them related to, to adaptation. Uh, in terms of the climate services, the MUSE, Multi-Hazard Early Warning Systems from WMO members suggest that Latin America faces with early warning capacity gaps, meaning that there are still some issues. Some countries are not able to do that. For instance, in terms of flood, river in floods, 60, 60 countries of 19, flash floods, 12 countries, drought, 13 countries. And in terms of early warning systems, you see a similar profile, you see? Uh, full in advance and then the inadequate. The inadequate in terms of early warning systems are really perhaps the, the particular for flash floods that are the disasters that kill more people are really inadequate. That means that there is a need to the countries to start working on this, that the climate services they offer take lead to population protection in terms of early warning systems or disaster. And the importance of strengthening the climate services is limited, not is limited only to early warning system. You see most of the 60% of the NDCs, basically the countries, they do weather forecast. You know? But multi-hazard early warning systems are essential, not just for the issue of it's going to rain more, but we want to see if this excess of rainfall increases the risk of flash floods or landslides in exposed areas yeah, uh, for weather extremes and climate extremes also. For instance, in Brazil, in the various states in Brazil, monitoring and alerts help to minimize related damage and protect human lives. That's the reason why 
Semadeg is a new multi-hazard early warning system in Brazil. Okay, and since we're talking about El Niño, a very quick review of the different indicators of El Niño, they show that we are already, since May 2023, in an El Niño. But perhaps the intensity of El Niño so far is not as intense as the previous El Niño in 2015, 1998, 83, uh, 86, 87. So, so far, in terms of intensity of El Niño, the previous one have been more intense, but we noticed that the impacts, particularly in South America, are higher, meaning that the vulnerability of the people, the number of death shows that vulnerability and exposure are increasing. So it doesn't matter if we have a moderate El Niño, less strong than 2016, the impacts seem to be higher, okay? And this is just a quick science <laughs> review on what El Niño is. El Niño is a warming of the tropical Pacific. I think uh, it has been understood that the picture in there is a uh, uh, May, uh, October, September, sea surface temperature maps. And if you notice, it is not the equatorial Pacific. It is not just the equatorial Pacific, which is warm. It's the North Pacific and the entire Atlantic Basin, and even the uh, Mediterranean Sea, part of the Indian Oceans. And Mediterranean Sea, remember this a tropical cyclone that affected Libya and killed more than 5,000 people. So what we have now, El Niño EP, the East Pacific. El Niño, when the warming is concentrated nearby the Pacific coast, and the El Niño CP, the El Niño more concentrated the warming in the Central Pacific. And what we have now is more like the El Niño East Pacific. And if you see the impacts in there, the red colors, no, sorry, the brown colors mean less rainfall and the blue colors means more rainfall. And right now in South America, for instance, we are in September, October, November. And this is what's going on. A lot of rainfall in the south and drought in the uh, uh, north part of the Amazon. And if the situation keeps going like this, the situation is going to become even worse in Austral summer and outer Austral fall. Austral fall is the peak of the rainy season in Northeast Brazil. And if you see the brown color in there, may suggest that we are going to have dry, very, very dry conditions on that region. Uh, and if you notice 2023, this is the, the, let's say, the evolution of sea surface temperature in El Niño 3-4, which is a region in the Central Pacific in there. And you see, for instance, these are other years and 2023 is the warmest from at least from the period between 1971 and 2000. Okay, and if you see in the map of sea surface temperatures, like I said before, it's not just the Pacific, it's the North Pacific and the Atlantic region, tropical and extratropical. Remember that the Hurricane Lee, for instance, ended up in the north of the United States, nearby Canada, because if you see the extreme warm waters in their favor, the presence of the hurricanes in there. Okay, so it has been a very unusual year. I mean, as, and these are the typical impacts we see in El Niño. You see, during El Niño, for, for instance, brown means the warm and dry, which is mean less hurricanes. But at least until now, I'm not sure if the situation has changed, but we have the Rina hurricane. So basically we have a lot of hurricanes that we are still fourth in the list, okay? And of course, the number of hurricanes has increased because the tropical Atlantic has, in, has uh, warm. And in this case, the El Niño, the interaction between El Niño is highly correlated, working very, very close together with the Atlantic. So we have two major players this year, the El Niño in the Pacific and the warm Atlantic in the tropical North Atlantic. So it's a combination of both. Okay, like I said, these are the patterns of sea surface temperature, just quickly, December, January, February, and the second column is March, April, May. You see 1983, 1998, the 2005, which was a dry year in Amazon, 2010, and 2016. You see, and this is the March, April, May. And in some of them, like 1983, the tropical Atlantic was relatively cooler in Austral summer, but it got warmer 
in uh, the Austral Fall. And in the others, you see this combination between Atlantic and Pacific, you see. And when we talk about drought in the Amazon or drought in Northeast Brazil, each drought is different. For instance, in 1983, you see the red color that shows the drought in the central and northern part of the Amazon. In 1998, it's basically most of the Amazon. In 2005, was the southern part of the Amazon, the same region that seems to be affected by droughts now. In 2010, we have the central and North Pacific. And in 2016, we have the whole Amazon. So each drought is different, not just in the Amazon, but also in Northeast Brazil. You see, for instance, in Northeast Brazil, the uh, negative rainfall anomalies are concentrated in some regions. In 98, it was the whole region. In 2005, it was the northern part of the region. But we we go to March, April, May, which is the peak of the rainy season in Northeast Brazil, the situation changed. 2016, 98, and 1983 were very similar in terms of intensity of the drought. Okay, and in terms of the, the consequences of El Niño, one of the consequences of El Niño is the increase of rainfall in the southern part of Brazil. I mean, the La Plata basin. And this is what happened in the first days of, of September. Uh, almost 58 people died, I mean, 51 people dead and seven missing because of the rainfall. If you see the, the Taquari River, because of this rainfall, it raised almost 17 meters in two days. And the population were very small. Many people died, particularly people above 60 years old, people with less uh, possibility of running, moving, or like many young people did, they climbed basically to the roof of the houses, and they were not able to do that and die because of this. And what we have now also, the opposite, is the drought situation. You see, it's interesting to see this map on the lower right. You see the blue color, which is the, the, the state of Rio Grande do Sul, where the previous slide shows, blue color more than 300 millimeters above normal, and then this color, orange color, is the drought. So we have in Brazil, which is a continental country, basically, uh, two extremes. And in terms of maximum temperatures, higher temperatures in there. And what happened in the Amazon, something that has no precedence, is uh, what we call the botos, botos, corde rosa. This is sort of a dolphin, which is typical from the Amazon. I mean, it has never been reported, but at the time, were 110, but 120 of these animals die because of uh, heat stress. It has never been observed in the past in the Amazon. At least there is no data showing this kind of in impacts, particularly in spring. I mean, spring is basically part of the dry season. Well, dry in the Amazon is relative. It rains, but it's not zero. Okay, and the onset of the rainy season. And this is the situation we have right now, for instance. The civil defense is, is having a move, uh, mobile water treatments, and the drought affects the population. And this is free, the Black Friday, it really is Black Friday, meaning that the most of the, the people, most of the commerce uh, bring their goods for selling in the city of Manaus, but the Rio Negro levels were so low that they couldn't move. And this, if you see in this figure where the Rio Negro in Manaus, the dot line represents the climatology and the red color represents 2023. And we have reached the lowest level in 125 years. So half of the year rainfall was, a river level was above normal. And the other half river level was below normal. And you see the smokes, for instance, affected the city of Manaus. The drought left many small communities, what we call Ribeirinhos, people living along the banks of the river without access to food. Uh, what the impacts show, the impacts show in terms of forecast uh, that this situation is still going on. September, October, November, November, December, uh, November, December, January, for instance, more rainfall in this region and less rainfall in this region. And of course, the more classical region affects the northern part of Peru and Ecuador and certain Chile, which are the regions affected by more rainfall. And Northeast Brazil and the northern part of the Amazon 
uh, we have less rainfall than normal. And in terms of temperature, basically, it will be warmer. So this is the utility, the usefulness of, of, of climate forecast. See? And then, in terms, the best way to be prepared for the future is to adapt to extreme conditions in the present with the current climate variabilities. And if countries don't do that, if they don't get adaptation or priority areas uh, that need to be for mitigation, for the present, it will be very hard to have in the future. For instance, priority areas for adaptation in Latin America. The first one is agricultural and food security, then water, then health, then ecosystem biodiversity, and then disaster risk reduction, you see? And in terms of priority areas for mitigation, energy, transport, land use, and land cover, agriculture, waste, and industry. So in terms of disaster risk reduction, people seem to be more concerned with the food security, the water security, the health security, ecosystem biodiversity, and disaster risk reduction seems to be, I wouldn't say lower priority, but middle priority, when, when in fact it should be higher priority. Then, in terms of disasters, the social reactions of a disaster, the communicable diseases consequences of a disaster, like having risk of contamination in refugee camps, as it happens in, in Fortaleza, as I explained before, population displacement, they move to other places that are already in trouble. You see, and sometimes when they move, they are bringing diseases, so nobody noticed that. Then hazards to exposure, uh, disasters in temperate climates, for instance, food and nutrition, food shortages due to uh, drought conditions, for instance, water supply and sanitation, drinking water is a major problem. The mental health is something that not too many people have been considered, like anxiety, neurosis, and depression. Our post-disaster uh, diseases that are really increasing and that People should care, take care about that. The communities and the government should, should be considering those as a consequence of a disaster. And of course, the disaster related to health structure. You see, because sometimes, like we have seen here in Brazil, in, uh, the rainfall is so high that the hospital, the main hospital get flood or the water is uh, basically filtering and then is coming from the roof of the hospital. The hospital has to be abandoned which is a major problem because that's the place where uh, people who has been affected by the disaster should be there. If there is no hospitals in there, they will depend basically on the army or voluntary donations, but that's a major health problem in there. Well, with this, uh, I finished my presentation. I was trying to, to give some focus in, in El Nino and their consequences, and also to the issue of extremes of climate variability. El Niño now is the best example of what's going on in South America and probably in other regions of the world. And then the possible impacts of interannual climate variability extremes in several sectors of, of human life, including health. Okay, well, with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm available for questions if, if any. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, a question, do we want to move on with the second presentation or do we want to um, move on to Haley, the questions right now? Um, let's go to Carolina's presentation now. Okay, excellent. Carolina, good morning. Uh, just a brief presentation uh, that I did at the beginning, but I want to highlight that uh, Carolina has a great trajectory um, in, a, in the sector of social organizations of development and international cooperation. So welcome to the session and the screen is all yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hola, buenos días con todos y con todas. Uh, well, Carolina. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carolina Portalupe. I work in technical assistance uh, in the UN program, uh, development program, mostly in post uh, disaster recovery. And today I wanted to make a brief presentation by, uh, but I wanted to say hi from the ancestral community of Sinchal in the province of Santa Elena 
And I, my presentation is about an experience that we are conducting. And the experience um, that I'm going to, the case that I'm going to discuss with you is ongoing and it has to do with creating uh, community situation rooms in Ecuador. And first, I want to give you some context. The context is one in which, for example, right now we have an orange alert issued by the risk management secretary, which is in charge of risk, uh, disaster risk management in Ecuador, monitoring uh, the threats uh, from El Niño in 2023 and 2024. And as part of that orange alert, we have identified that 17 of the 34 provinces in the country have a high likelihood of impacts by floods and landslides, 100, and 43 of the municipalities, and 48 local rural parishes, which are that's part of the smaller population, and estimated based on what happened in 82, 83, 97, 98, most of all, but also in the last floods that we had in 2008 and 2023, it's estimated that the El Nino is going to affect all sectors, society, the healthcare sector, housing, infrastructure, and the subsector of water and sanitation, telecommunications, electricity, etc. The productive sector as well, with a special emphasis on agriculture and cattle raising, but also in the industries, in urban areas. And it is estimated that we will have significant damage and losses uh, taking uh, compared to the what happened in 82 and 97. So this would be the direct results of this event. And so we have also estimated that the human impact may be huge and it can bring us, it can lead to setbacks in across all the SDGs uh, goals. So even after the pandemic, there was an assessment that estimated the damages and losses at $17 million. The impact of this uh, ENOS uh, will be significant as well. Econo macroeconomically, also um, some significant damages are predicted at the balance of trade, balance of payments, and an increase, um, a sustained increase in prices, uh, that what is called inflation. In Ecuador, we also have experience of how poorly managed disasters have an impact on governance. After El Niño in 97, 98, we had a period of political instability. We had several administrations, uh, different governments uh, during a short period of time. And so that increases instability and the likelihood of conflict. So something we didn't have back then was an exponential increase in all kinds of violence especially in the coastal areas from the province of Esmeraldas and to Guayaquil. And this is believed that if, if this, it is believed that if it is not well managed, this can have a negative impact on political stability, violence, and conflict. 
So with that scenario, what is the need? The Secretary of Risk Management, which as I mentioned, is in charge of managing disaster risk in the country, has requested the UN technical assistance from the UNPD to basically reinforce four things, coordination, information, communication, and this that we call preparedness for recovery. This chart that I'm showing here shows a little bit how the national decentralized risk management system works. And this was created by our constitution uh, passed in 2018, and it is written in the in Article 389 and 390 of our constitution, where it stated that this uh, risk management system it includes all levels of government, the central state, all provinces, all parish councils or cantons. And it will work under the principle of subsidiary decentralization. So this means that um, whoever is at the lowest level at the territory in the territory should be able to respond. And in case uh, if they don't have the, the capacity, then the next level of government should step in, but always respecting the political authority of whoever is in the territory. So what does this mean is that for this system to work, we need each of the levels of government to work within their competences. The central state doesn't have the same uh, competences as a province, a provincial government or as a, a parish council. So we need uh, that the flow of information to go from the lower levels of the territory to go up to the higher level so that this principle of subsidiary responsibility can be applied. And in this pyramid, what is in green, the central state, the provinces, the cantons and the parish governments are not just, don't just include uh, their competence, but we also have um, a national risk uh, disaster committee. We have uh, committees, uh, emergency operations committees at the lower levels as well. And for the parish councils, we have something that is an emergency parish um, council. And those exist, and these uh, have become institutionalized throughout the country after the, the approval of the constitution in 2008. But uh, there's uh, we have found that there are gaps in coordination and information at the lowest level of government in the territory. So we mean small communities, small towns. These are territorial units that are part of a parish council, but it's the lowest, the smallest level. For example, to mention something here, I'm in the ancestral community of Sinchal today, uh, which is one of the 18 communities in the Manglar Alto uh, Parish Council, which is also part of the Santa Elena Canton of the Santa Elena province. So a rural parish, such as the one where, where I am uh, today speaking to you from, uh, has seven, 18 ancestral communities. And so we don't just need the rural parish board to we need to include also those 
other levels. So because these are spread out throughout the territory, and so these are not just uh, spread out throughout the territory, but in case of a disaster, they need to have the ability to, to be the first responders. So from this capacity that has been identified to so that this principle of subsidiary decentralization can work properly and thinking of uh, how our country is going to respond to El Nino. What we have been working on with our secretariat is in guiding these much lower levels of, of the territory to um, have what we call a community situation room. And this community situation room is a place from which we need to coordinate um, information gathering. During a yellow alert or an orange alert, for example, we have been working so that that gathering of information can uh, first identify threats, um, uh, adverse events, capacities, vulnerabilities, and per so that perhaps when we have to respond, we also need to collect information about the response to emergencies that have taken place, but also the needs and, and the gaps that we identify in a commune, for example. And the idea that we have is that all of this information that is produced and obtained with participation from local stakeholders, it can be useful so that the local boards can make the best decisions. For example, we have been providing guidance so that these smaller territorial units um, can identify actions to mitigate uh, the effects of an event such as El Niño, but also strengthen capacities and preparedness to be able to provide a first response. And something else for this community room would be to have um, communication with the higher levels of government to be able to address the, the needs of care of the population that has been affected. What do we need to create a situation, a community situation room? Well, these guidelines are, we have tried to, for them to be useful in the most precarious situations with little resources, and the first thing we need is for this room to not just be up in the air, but we need the authorities in the local community levels, uh, the commune, the town council, the parish board will create a risk management uh, committee that includes the community and the technical teams that work in the territory. For example, where I am today in Sinchal, we have a health unit of the Ministry of Health, a primary care unit, and there's also a unit of the that is also connected to social security. And so we need this community situation room to also include the healthcare providers, technical teams, but we also have educators that work um, inside and also in outreach to the community on child's on children's health. And we also need to have the leaders of the water administration boards, some community entities that are responsible for providing water to the communities. So the idea is to have a commission that it brings in mixed teams, including leaders, women and men from the neighborhoods and the smaller communities 
Uh, but that will also include the technical staff of the people who work on healthcare, on child children development and water. So the goal is to have those teams to work on a community plan. When we talk about a community plan, it's a very simple thing. Something that we do in a context of a small assembly with all these stakeholders. And the purpose of that plan is to identify all those things that can help us reduce risks at home, in the neighborhoods, communities, and in the bigger area of the community. On the other hand, the other question we ask is, what do we have to do to increase those response capacities? And it's um, unbelievable that at the beginning, when you think about it, uh, we, be we believe there's a little resources, but the in fact, as we talk things through, we realize that we can find different types of resources. So the goal is to have these first response brigades. We also need to prepare community evaluation, risk evaluation groups. We call EVIN in, in Ecuador, which is initial needs evaluation we don't ask them to have that but at least to have an initial report that helps us provide basic information to assign these evin evaluators uh, who are people working around that system so we're promoting community alert systems very simple things such as identifying levels of floods or risks to light posts so that if um, and the um, there is a, a level a little line marked on those posts so that if people see that that level is increased or ex excess in excess they have to evacuate here we have um, piece of paper that we worked on with the Santa Elena and Barcelona community. And this is regarding the ENOS uh, 2023 and 2024. And here we talked about what uh, we can do to increase people's capacities at the level of homes, neighborhoods, uh, communes, and uh, administration boards. And there we have a good number of houses and this is was done in with uh, the participation of all the stakeholders so we need a plan we also need to work as a team this photograph is a photo of Sincha community i'm actually in that very office right now and here we have all the staff and there we're identifying on that map children aged zero to three and also homes with pregnant women or children that have chronic malnutrition so this is something we're doing with child development staff and also with information from the community town council so we need a few things for that this photograph is what we call a kit provided by the secretary of the risk management. This is um, something that has been identified for first response to risks, but due to the lack of uh, resources in Ecuador, only the boards that are under the administration of the, this Secretariat of Risk Administration have been provided. So they only exist at province level and the more than 220 municipalities. But that kind of equipment is not available in smaller communities. But we need at least a physical space um, 
working tables, chairs, markers, if available, a computer, internet access. Of course, that's not always possible in all communities. So it's a basic kit. For example, in places where there's no internet available or com computers available, we at least work with other alternatives that are less expensive and more accessible to the communities. What can be done is, for example, with this map, we have the map of the ancestral community of Sinchal. And here we identified all the neighborhoods, all the zones that were at uh, flood and landslide risk. And there we were putting layer over layer with information about homes with uh, pregnant women, with um, children in malnutrition, with uh, elderly people or houses in uh, poor situation in terms of infrastructure, also water canals that have to be cleaned up, etc. So first of all, there we can have information about the risks, the capacities, the threats, of course, people with higher risks, also meeting points and possible temporary lodging so that we can help uh, people at more risk. Also, we will able to have information once the events occur, information about those happening events, the main effects of those events, the response, the assistance gaps, and to be able to provide that information to the next level of government administration. In conclusion, to finish this presentation, we consider that this type of initiative helps improve the preparedness and response to the ENOS 2023-2024. It helps us understand the needs of the population to provide assistance with the community resources and to coordinate from the community humanitarian response under the impartiality, neutrality, independence principles. Also, it helps improve the flows of information among the smaller levels of territory and the state or the government institutions that has uh, wider capacities. We know who we can provide this information, how we do it, what gaps can be notified, and what are the vulnerable groups. It also helps multi-level coordination and promotes the participation of the different stakeholders in the territory. And by improving that flow of information, also multi-level information coordination can be improved from the smaller or the lower level to the government level. So all this is aimed at reducing the loss of human lives and also the damages and economic losses associated with the disaster. We also think it helps increase awareness about the risk, the danger and the need to be more resilient in our communities. Thank you. Carolina and Jose, thank you very much for those presentations. Thank you to all the participants um, for their questions on the Q&A chat. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Angelica Gutierrez. I work at the Atmosphere and Oceans office here in the US, specifically in the meteorological section. And it's a pleasure for me to be your moderator. From the questions, we have chosen the most relevant ones. We have participants from different countries. So the questions have been selected 
in a way that we can, they can, the answers can cover several geographical areas. The first question is to Jose, based on your experience, what are the factors originating climate change and how can we prevent their historical season aspect? I think you're referring to the extremes, something that has been noticed around the world and that has been reported is that extremes are ext increasing in intensity. And when we talk about intensity, we talk about heat waves, for example, for example, also cold weather or fires. We have seen fires in Bolivia, Peru, and it's probably a, a warmer or hotter year. So extremes are increasing, and we consider this is a scenario that has already been noticed now, and the IPCC projections are including that change. We have to increase our vulnerability and exposure information and um, awareness, and that requires more policies. So that's something that we should be working more on with, uh, along with the government, with um, risk management, risk reduction policies. That would be my response, because we see that extremes are changing. The very El Nino is not classified based on an index. We know that it is having more impacts than previous El Nino. So we see things are changing and the impacts are, are changing. So we have to notice that. Thank you, Jose. Carolina, how do universities participate in this um, community decision boards? Well, normally this community holds uh, include several stakeholders in the case of Ecuador, the, what we call polytechnic schools or universities, they tend to have local projects. For example, in my local area, that is an ancestral community on the coastal line in Manglar Alto Parish, civil parish in Santa Elena province. Here we have local universities. And the Santa Elena State University has programs in our area, but it, also we have the coast region university also support us. And uh, they provide technical assistance to the what we call the parish government in terms of preparedness and also to help us increase capa response capacity. So in the specific case of this smaller community, we have the higher coast university. They work with the water administration unit and they have been monitoring water quality in reservoirs and in home in homes. They have been supporting us to have more automated monitoring processes. In the past, these monitoring processes were done manually, and there was a single gentleman who knows how to do everything. And if he stops working, the system is going to collapse. So the academic, the academia there, they're helping us have more automated processes for that. And for sure, water supply is going to be a problem because, for example, in 2020 floods, we had contamination of water sources and some of the water pipes broke and the water quality was very 
poor. So that not only affects people's health, but also it uh, brings us far from the goal of preventing child malnutrition that we know is very high in Ecuador. Thank you, Carolina. As you mentioned, the Espol, the coast uh, region university, I would like to thank her for uh, that great work. And the next question, we go back to Jose. I'm going to put two questions in one. Why are the risks higher this year if El Nino is not that strong? And what are the risks for the Amazon basin? Well, to start with the uh, Amazon basin, we see a big drought in the western part of the region. It's not during the rainfall season, it's mostly in the spring, meaning um, that we're having a pre-rain season drought that wasn't happening in, pe in previous years. So the concern is that that drought will extend until summer in the southern hemisphere, and that would have very bad consequences, not only for the biodiversity, but also um, it would affect the population as there might be more wildfires, more smoke around, and also their um, transportation will be limited as they tend to move from one place to the other by boat on rivers. We see there are there is a smaller or lower rainfall during rainfall big seasons. Can you remind me of the first question? Sorry. You're muted, Angelica. en silencio, Angelica. Angelica, no escucho. Sí. Why are the risks higher while El Niño is not as strong, as bad as before? Well, we have been working with indexes for a while. For example, the ocean, water, temperatures, and other indexes. And that kind of index works in a linear system. If we look at those indexes, we see that the, C, the El Niño hasn't reached its peak and it's at a moderate intense level and it should be intense by now. So we shouldn't use those indexes only. Even if the El Niño is not considered as intense as it was in 2015, but we see the impacts are serious. So we see that the vulnerability to the exposition, exposure sorry, is higher. This means that populations are more vulnerable, for example, because they are building their houses closer to rivers. And as you know, when there are floods, there are bad consequences or because people are not taking the necessary measures uh, to, to be ready. And of course, that also is related to local policies there's no linear correlation between the intensity of the El Niño and its impacts. We can have high impacts even when El Niño is considered moderate uh, or intense as uh, it's happening at the moment. Thank you. Carolina, this is quite interesting. We know there is an organization chart for emergency response so that the different institutions sorry i'm going to change the question because it was incomplete i'm going to restart so although there is an organization chart for working in terms of emergency so that the different institutions can react the question is, how does that information go down to community level and how are communities informed, not only rural communities, but also 
urban communities that those prevention measures exist? Is there any communication system that makes all that information available to local people, for example, about risks of rainfall, specifically in Ecuador? How does that information go down to the community level, especially more vulnerable communities? Well, at uh, this time, perhaps because um, uh, everyone is talking about El Niño right now, I think it's the first time that El Niño is in the agenda in every conversation and, and uh, among families, and in communities. For example, I. I took a, a taxi today to bring me from a, a different area. And he was saying that, that they're concerned because tourism will probably go down, that he didn't feel like there was a, a, a response ready. So I, I think the issue is on the agenda. I also think the country has made efforts for preparation we have a risk management institutions uh, that issue first a yellow alert and then an orange alert. And we have a certain level of preparedness at the national level and also in autonomous subnational governments. Perhaps the challenge, the biggest challenge are these smaller communities because disasters are going to take place there. Those are the places where the rivers are going to overflow and flood the areas. The, the disasters have the impact at the local level. So that's why we need our biggest capacities for mitigation and for response to be at those local levels. So I wanted to mention that in the framework of this technical cooperation between the UN program and the National Secretariat of Risk Management, we have um, created some radio spots to uh, radio um, advisories to be broadcast in the national and through radio at the national level and also the importance of having family and more local community plans. Uh, that's something that has been stressed. And something that was done by the Secretary of Risk Management in coordination with the Ministry of Agriculture is to work on seven charts that aim to provide information for some economic activities, especially that have to do with agriculture and cattle raising, but especially aimed at small scale producers. For example, the production of crabs, the, the capture of crabs in, in some, for example, some rice uh, or corn farmers and to disseminate information so that people can make the the most resilient uh, climate uh, uh, decisions taking uh, and so we it's there's still a lot to do and and this is almost on top of of us so so jose a technical question So taking into account uh, climate variability, what happens with the uncertainty in mathematical models when we need to take decisions about a risk? Well, uh, uh, in my own experience, that's one of the biggest uh, risk um, you work with climate and you see that all models go in the same direction. For example, in, in our case for South America, a lot of rainfall for the coast of Peru and Ecuador, um, then some drought conditions in, in some parts of Brazil, Argentina. So when there's some a cause that is as big as El Nino, all models point in the same 
direction. Uh, but the thing is uh, about the rainfall, there's a difference uh, on whether it's uh, s spread out through a series of days or if it falls all at once. So we have different models for that. And so sometimes we need to use our personal experience as well. I know people who believe the model. So if the model tells you to jump off of the window of the 20th floor, they do. But um, there's no model that it's 100% accurate. There is always uncertainty. So when politicians uh, inform, they need to say uh, the prediction is so-and-so minus plus so-and-so. That indicates that there, there's an uncertainty. And this doesn't mean the models are wrong. It means they're not perfect. We need to use our heads, our experience, uh, what the data shows, what our experience shows. And so the model is a tool, the, a man-made tool to help us make decisions. But you cannot make your decisions exclusively on what the model projects or predicts. That is a great reflection, Jose, because um, this is also stressing the, the significance of the local knowledge, which is fundamental for decision making. And going back to Carolina, and I'm combining the two questions because they are uh, quite connected. The first one is a question made. Is the community situation room similar to, or is it a resilient system in the framework of the WHO? And the second one is, given that there are so many sectors and different stakeholders working on risk and resilience, uh, do they really achieve a transdisciplinary agreement? So uh, is there actual transdisciplinarity in actions? Well, um, I think what we are doing, we have identified within the, the institutional regulatory framework for risk management in a country, we have the risk management secretariat and we have identified a need to have a tool that will provide support at the community level to make the best decisions. And that tool, we, we call it community situation room. And yes, it, it is uh, connected to or, or uh, built uh, under the, the references of the strong frameworks that, that we have available. But for example, here, there's a healthcare unit and usually they have their own situation rooms. But we have decided to broaden the scope of this one for so that it's not just for the healthcare sector, but it's a room that involves all of the stakeholders from the community. So we have the healthcare sector, of course, that is key, but we also have protection where we have uh, child educators, but also people who work with highly vulnerable groups such as the elderly, people with disabilities, and we're also bringing in productive associations, people who are going to be very affected. For example, here where I am right now in this commune, they produce lemon. They are dependent on the production of lemon. There's a diversified production, unfortunately, which would increase resilience. So this increases the vulnerability. These, we have these agreements and we have a plan. And the idea is to build on that plan. So I saw that someone was asking about community committees, which are part of the decentralized risk management program. But 
the creation of those committees um, that, that is still too new and too few have been created. So we need to increase that so that they're not only at the parish level, but also at the lower levels. So for example, some other committees, others are calling them commissions, some others call them teams. Right now at this point, we don't care uh, about what they're called, but we care about what they do. So this community situation room, we think uh, it can be a tool for those teams to produce the information to make best the best decisions possible within their area, but also to communicate with the other levels of governments that they will have to go to when they, they have needs or, or gaps in the response. So that's what we're doing, I think. Uh, and next year, we will be able to tell you how we did. Well, we have uh, many, many questions that are super interesting. We were supposed to uh, finish right now. <laughs> we're out of, of time already, but I wanted to ask you if you can answer one or two more questions. And if you can stay and listen to that, that would be great. Uh, can you can you stay for five more minutes? Jose and Carolina? Yeah, no problem. I, I, I need to run out afterwards, but, but no problem. Because we're we're having some activities here. Well, okay, so the last question for Carolina. What regions in Ecuador are the most vulnerable? Do you have uh, references of the differences between Ecuador and Peru? Are there any joint or bilateral um, actions, given that there are sibling countries? And, and well, Ecuador is a, a quite a small country. It has 17 million people, 24 provinces. And so in the first scenario, our risk management secretariat has identified that out of the 24 provinces, 17 would be affected. Some are susceptible to floods and others uh, to mass movements or landslides. So in the coastal area, we also have uh, the threats from high waves from the sea. So it's a country in which 17 of its 24 provinces would be affected. And the estimates done, taking to account from sea level uh, to a higher area. And we already have experience with El Niño. And we also have a track record of events that didn't get as high to be as high as the El Niño, but they were um, included extreme rainfall. For example, in 2008, we were halfway through to El Niño um, considering rainfall, and we have 250,000 people who were directly affected by this. So we do have the El Niño event, but we're also more and more having these extreme weather events. Uh, right now, for example, we have a likelihood of high likelihood of rainfall. It is raining in some parts of the country. And we're thinking we're going to have blackout uh, because of the, the low levels of water that there are in the Amazon where we get our energy. So there have all already been some work meeting between our secretariat and their their uh, Peruvian counterparts. And I know that there's uh, the institute that is in Ecuador. There's an event on the 26th and the 27th. There's a meeting between Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia. I think Bolivia and Chile might be participating as well. So we're having a regional event. And we continue sharing information, of course, and coordinating, yes, between the counterparts. 
Thank you. Thank you, Carolina, so much. And the last question for Jose. And this is based on your experience. What strategies would you recommend for the areas of Tunis and Pia in Peru as for reducing vulnerability and regarding infrastructure, for example, how should houses be built? How should healthcare centers be built? What is your experience? Well, uh, I haven't been there for many years. The last time was in 83 after the destruction in Pura. And the, the houses don't have any way of draining the water because it never rains. So I think with the experience of El Nino that we have had, uh, cities should be ready. For example, the, the roofs of the houses don't have protection because it doesn't rain, it's a really dry area. So it's really arid. So perhaps after the experience of El Nino, there has been uh, some preparation and this uh, El Nino event has been announced since May of this year. So there has been plenty of time for people to start preparing. I'm not talking about adaptation, that's a more longer term. Uh, to see ways of, of draining the rainwater in places where there is no sewage. I don't know exactly, uh, honestly, but um, in my experience, in what happened in 96, 97 was very destructive in uh, so uh, almost 40 years after those intense events, I should imagine that there has been something done um, due to the experience, the years of, of floods. And there should be something that it's already in the political agenda because the Nino is here to stay. It's not something that happens every 100 years. It's happening, happening periodically. Uh, thank you, Jose, some important notes to take into consideration, some practices. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for the um series these sessions and these presentations and to the participants uh, hopefully you will be able to join us for the next sessions have a great day everyone thank you so much thank you for all this information we have learned a lot today thank you so much again thank you everyone have a great day thank you bye bye thank you